welcome to the SBCA podcast, Component Connection. Hello, my name is Sean Shields, and today I'll be your host for this SBCA podcast series, looking at how component manufacturers around the country are innovating to take advantage of opportunities in today's market. My guest today is Dean Reyna, owner and president of TrustFab in Glendale, Arizona. On a single facility basis, TrustFab is the largest component manufacturer in Arizona and one of the largest in the nation. Their sales territory extends throughout Arizona into Southern Nevada and Southern California. Dean has been in business for 28 years and has worked his way all the way through the ranks. All right, so here's your first softball question. So Dean, tell me a little bit about how you got into the trust business. Um, I got into trust business uh, when I was in high school. Um, my cousin worked for a, a trust plant and he said uh, they needed it was more of a summer job, <clears throat> um, excuse me, but um, first job was kind of running plans, picking up checks, and kind of went into um, building uh, four trusses and starting in the yard. And, and I actually left that, went back to school um, after uh, the, uh, a year at ASU, went to community college for two years, and then my cousin, I think this is in the early 90s, was running a big facility out in South Chandler, Arizona, and said, hey, come on over and start building trusses. So we just, my cousin ran a big facility, started in the yard, and kind of got going from there. Well, what was the thing that you liked the <clears throat> most about working in those days? Like, what, what appealed you know, to you? Ba- it's funny, you know, as being a, owner now with the high technology driven uh, business we're in now i've came from the old school mentality you know wood tables not really you know semi-automated saws so it was like a lot less regulation back then we kind of ran a little wild (laughs) and uh, the stories that we tell from back then to today obviously probably could never happen in a facility today but you know, we ran hard. Um, we didn't have the sophisticated software equipment like we do today. So when I see the struggles out in the, our facility today, I can always let them know, hey, I understand your frustration, but here's how we used to do it. And uh, they're like, wow. So just kind of bringing the knowledge and from when I was on the tables back growing up and, you know, being able to educate and talk to the guys with the newer equipment, you know, they know what I'm talking about. And we are, we actually have a few guys building for me today, which were in the yard shoot 25 years ago, building trusses still working today. And uh, it's, it's kind of fun seeing their face now running building trusses when i used and they're the ones that taught me how to build trusses i bet well speaking of commiserating with um your current employees what was the thing that you hated the most hated the most about the working in the trust facility (laughs) right (laughs) um back in the day it was a lot harder we had to lift more um we didn't have the equipment that we have today to make it easier on the guys. So I remember down stacking piles and piles of lumber, carrying it into the tables, uh, bending over all day. I don't even think we had shade for a while. Um, And we are in Arizona, so it's 125 in the summer on blacktop. So, uh, and then we were actually running on an old steel uh, gantry table uh, burning our knees, bending down, bending over with wrenches to, for the, you know, the jigging. And so, yeah, the struggles of just a lot harder work lifting. Um, so now seeing the stuff we have today, I try to make it a lot easier on my guys because I know what it was like to work out in the yard and, you know, hurting our back and carrying multiple two by fours, two by sixes over our heads or different workstations. And the last thing I want my guys to do is pick up any lumber over their head or bend over and pick up off the ground. 
I've taken a lot of the stuff that I don't like or I didn't like building in the yard and really tried to make my facility, you know, friendlier, easier, less strenuous. And that's kind of my main thing on when I've seen this automated equipment and the different things that they offer to, to build. It, it, it just, I love it because now you could take a less skilled guy, um, you know, even some older guys and, and, you know, not as strong that can still get volume out because we've made it a lot easier for them fabrication wise and easier pieces to lift and those kind of things. So they're not as strenuous as it was when I was out there. So given how the sort of the back breaking work that you had to do early on, what is it about the truss industry that that sort of sucked you in and kept you in to the point where now you've you you've spent thirty some years doing it or almost thirty years doing it? But what was it? Well, you know, I started from the bottom, right? I, I think there's a lot of stories of guys like me that started in the yard the yard sweeping, moved to the tables building, then they get their opportunity to go into the design office, start designing. Um, then, you know, I became a uh, design manager up to, all the way to sales manager, to vice president, to president, uh, to owner. And I've designed it, I've sold it, I've built it. So bringing that to, the, to all of my entities now um, has really given me the opportunity to, to teach and grow and give opportunity to the guys that won it because somebody gave me an opportunity and and that's where I'm at today. It really kind of gave me the platform and the opportunity to be where I'm at today. So I, I'm, I'm always looking for that next guy out in the yard that we always try to promote within, uh, give guys opportunity for, for growth and, you know, teach those guys to be the next designer. I, I haven't hired a designer in, uh, I don't even know how many years. My design staff has been with me since the early 90s. Uh, we all came from another company. Um, so shoot, I think some of the designers that work for me now have been with me for 25 years. We've been together. Um, we we know how we all work and what it takes. So just being able to reflect on when I was out in the yard and all the things that I've learned through the process I bring all of that into my facilities now and constantly try to evolve, change. What can we do better? What equipment's out there? How can I make it easier on my guys? How can I do more with less skilled labor? So this automation has really, really got me excited. Uh, the new linear saws, the automated jigging tables, the monitors, the paper going paperless. Um, and it takes a lot of work to, to implement all that change. A lot of people kind of shy away from that change because it, it does take a lot of time and effort. And I was out in the yard for probably six months trying to implement that change and teach and force them to use it. And they finally bought in and like, and, and they're like, yeah, you know what, this is, I don't know why I fought it. You know, change is scary, change is hard. It takes a lot of work and it was probably one of the best things I ever did. What kind of really, it, it was kind of a fluke. I went to MyTech, I'm a MyTech customer, went to MyTech for, um, to, to, to tour their facility in St. Louis where they manufacture the plates. And I think we went to a football game or something. And then when I was in there, I saw the blade saw, which is the MyTech's automated uh, linear saw. And I haven't really paid attention to it that much. And I started watching it and looking at it. They were, they were doing a demo on it, some other customer. And I saw that and I was with my general manager, Bill, at the time. And I told him I want that saw like right now. This saw is a game changer. And that was the first part of our whole change. That saw single-handedly changed my whole company, my outlook my efficiency levels basically that saw replaced eight employees 
obviously we took those employees and put them somewhere else. But I had eight speed cuts, metric cuts, uh, on one. I think there was six on one on the first shift, six guys, and the second shift had five. So technically, eleven guys, and the return on that was just amazing. So when I saw that blade saw, that was the the turning point of automation for TF companies. What year was that? Man, I'm trying to think back. So that first blade saw I got, I want to say, man, I'm as I get older, I kind of <laughs> you kind of lose time. But I think I want to say that saw is maybe seven years old, maybe. I'd have to do I'd have to do a little bit of due diligence on. We have four now, so that's how much I liked it. I'd have to I, I got to think back when we got it. I want to say so, man. Trying to think back, I got to think probably like probably like six or seven years old, maybe longer. Okay. I forgot what model yeah. number it is, but it's uh, it's it's an early it's an early model. So that was sort of right after we started emerging from that prolonged downturn, essentially. Yeah, it was after after the recession. Hmm. I want to step back just a little bit. I want to get into the automation, but I want to take one step back. You know, one of the things that you mentioned that you do is uh, a lot of time um, mentoring to your employees, you know, helping them look at easier ways of doing things, giving them appreciation for um, sort of where the industries come from. I'm curious, can you name any of the the people who you think were, were influential to you as you developed early in your career, middle of your career, um, and how they they came alongside you, how they mentored you. Yeah, so I mean, I've I've pondered this question a, a lot, and a lot of people have have came through. And when I was younger, um, in the industry, and I've I've grabbed bits and pieces from different people, but probably one of the more innovative guys I met in my young careers, coming up and and watching and processing was Jeff Campbell. He was uh, the old owner. Uh, we, I came from my first trust facility, it was Triangle Trust. Um, he, his, his vision was way ahead of his time. I'm still on the database we helped write together, um, which I don't have support on it anymore. So it's uh, now we're starting to look at some other databases, whether we want to go out and, and, and get on my tech sapphire or build our own or, or, or whatever. But the things he did, um, he was probably one of the first guys that started bringing up remote designers. And I want to say this was back in, man, I really got to get my dates together, but I want to say this was back in the early nineties where he came up with a concept where he wanted to have designers all across the country and design for multiple locations, which is pretty pretty common nowadays. Here at TrustFab, we, I think we have three remote designers now. Um, so just the vision he had and what he taught me to understand the numbers, to understand the, the complexity of design and how it all goes together and putting the numbers and the setups and the runs, just we've had, and when I started this business in 2005, he actually helped me set up uh, my pricing structure and my database. And I think to this day, we still, a lot of those numbers make sense from when we built 15 years ago. And they they don't, they haven't changed a whole bunch. The automated equipment obviously uh, has helped a lot, but if you look at the numbers we talked about back in the day when when I was building trusses to today, a lot of those units of measures are still pretty close. So yeah, Jeff Campbell, huge, huge mentor to me. I think he's actually up north still in the trust game. But uh, um, actually, my cousin James Davis was my uh, was the production manager in the yard. Um, he uh, kind of gave me my shot and and told Jeff Campbell, hey, this guy needs to be in the dis in the design uh, office and that kind of gave me my shot. Uh, he actually, James actually left uh, that company and started multiple trust plants in Arizona has been successful uh, 
in the in the trust business and um it's funny he was actually mad at me cuz I didn't go work he helped us, he opened uh, Fargo Trust in Arizona and I stayed at Triangle cuz they Jeff Campbell kind of kept me there and <laughs> James was a little upset I didn't go with him but he gave me my shot but but yeah Jeff Campbell James Davis huge huge guys um to really help me to be where I'm at today. So you started your your company Trust Fab in 2005. Correct. That must have been kind of challenging. Yeah. So um, great 05, um, pretty good 06, and then oh crap, here we go. So um, I think I think the recession really i think the people still in business today i mean it, it was unfortunate right we lost a lot of good companies there was a really big facility across the street from me there's pretty much a nationally known company shuck and sons been around i remember as a kid driving by their facility and all the semis and chrome rims and just this great facility and they actually didn't make it through we made it through and I and I sit back and I'm like, how did we make it? And I think every manufacturer was in the same boat. We owed a lot of money. The banks didn't want to work with anybody. Um, but I was still selling, and and the drive just it, it 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 kept me going. And I'm a big believer in you know tell people the truth. Um, you know, people were coming to my office and they wanted to check for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, but I had. $30,000. And I said, Hey, as soon as I don't, as soon as I do, don't do something, I say, go ahead and pull the plug. So the vendors were our banks and we made it through it. And we really had to sit back. I think we're all, we all thought maybe the market would crash 40, 50%, but I think it was up to 90%. And I think a lot of us cut late, cut people late because we we're just trying to make it work. And and um, I basically went to my staff and it was unfortunate we lost some good people and some of the key guys, you know, we, we, we figured it out. We had to adjust salaries. I think as owners, you know, we had to really stop taking money and trying to figure it out. So very hard, difficult time, hard to still talk about it. Cause I remember I was probably maybe one or two days from going out of business. I had that line in the sand and, and it was weird just, you know, my vendors, I still, there's still work to be done. You know, it's hard when the big national builders were doing a lot of work for them and we used to get paid in 30 days and then they tell you they're going to pay you in 60 and 90 days. Well, the lumber guys need their money. The banks need their money. So I think the companies that made it through the recession really understand how to run a business. That was a huge educational session for me. I was good at building trusses. I really didn't know how to run a business that well. And it really taught me how to, to how to run a business and deal with the adversity and, and, and the challenging times. And I think some of the companies that went out of business, I don't want to say they should have, but you know, some of these guys were not great business owners and then we lost some really good ones. So it, it really, it, it changed the game. It, it, you know, with as much work as it is out there today, and just coming up with the uh, the capacity constraints, we I take on a lot of work because I know what it's like not to have work. So my my salesman and my de and my design staff in the yard are like, Dean, uh, you know we can only do this much a month, right? I go, Hey man, it's okay, we'll be good. But I know what it's like not to have work, so I take everything I can. So the recession was a was a game changer for me, was an eye opener, and kind of really. We, we run so different now uh, because of that. And I think most companies do that. We really had to check, you know, we were pretty much order taking back then. I don't know. So I think Arizona did, I want to say we did 63,000 units in 2005, mm -hmm. um, which was just insane. And I think we're doing now maybe 20 to 24 and we can't even build those houses now but we were building 63,000 back in 2005. Uh, that was uh, that was a crazy time, but I'm glad we made it. We're still in business and and uh, we did business the right way and that's why we're here today. So you stuck through it. 
I mean, through obviously some very difficult times. And even before then, you decided to become a business owner. So you obviously see something in the trust industry um, that a lot of people don't necessarily see, sort of the advantages, the market, the opportunities for, for structural building components. Can you talk a little bit about sort of what you see this industry offers and why it's a good business to be in? So trying to get, so I have two younger, uh, two, my two boys work for my lumber company. Um, one's 28 and the other one's 24. They both uh, graduated college, played baseball in college. So they, so they worked the summers in the trust yard and I didn't think it would be attractive for them to want to work here. But business is business, manufacturing is manufacturing. So trying to to sell this business to or make it attractive to this, you know, this younger generation today is it's not that difficult now because I had that, you know, I had, you know, their friends to tap into and 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 those things. So when it's kind of cool and fun to them, like, man, we got something here. So this equipment. And the and the software, and the the automation that is 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 coming out. I think we're in the forefront of change in our industry. Everything you read, you know, LinkedIn has really just everything I read on that intrigues me. Faster, better, cleaner, offsite construction, automation, wall panels, floor cassettes, all of this you know, the, the Kateras of the world and the Antecras of the world and these new companies popping up, you know, change isn't easy. Uh, I think in the Southwest, we do business a lot different than most of the country with us selling to the framing manufacturer. Um, I never want to be a framing contractor. Um, that doesn't interest me, but I'll build components all day long, whether it be trusses, wall panels, floor cassettes, stairs. I want to I want to I want to provide a product which will make it easy for the guys in the field. Now how that's done gets a little difficult. Um because I'm like same like when I grew up in the yard, well I'm you know, I'm lifting these heavy pieces of 2 by 4 and 2 by 6 across the yard, I'm breaking my back, I'm bending over all day. It was we don't have any of that in my yard now. But I see that happening in the field, guys bending over all day, a guys, you know, got 10 two by fours walking from the street to the slab to bring, to build the wall and bend it over on the ground. And in this Arizona, it's 125 degrees. And this younger generation, there's no way they want to do that. So how do we build houses with a younger generation that will go out there and work in 125 degrees and build a house? Well, you have to make it easy for them and you have to sell them on it. Hey guys, you see these wall panels, throw it on the cart, roll it to the slab, hold it up. You're going to get paid $25, $30 an hour as a, as a salary for a kid in college or in high school. That's, that's pretty good money. Well, that's not near the money that they're paying these framing contractors to stick frame houses. It's, it's getting out of control. So I think the builders want change. Um, and, and the forward thinkers, the innovators, I kind of tend to think of me as one of those guys that I'm going to embrace the technology. I'm going to um I'm going to try to to sell it to the guys that want it or educate the guys that have questions about it. You know, let's be honest, it doesn't work for every scenario. Um there's always going to be stick framing, but you know, with the prefabricated wall panels and the equipment out there, the equipment's come a long way. I mean, people have prefabbed, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. I don't know. I'm still kind of young in this industry. There's a lot older, smarter guys than me out there. But I think with the technology that's out there to build these wall panels, you know, designing them in the software, dropping in the, the plates or ink. I mean, my panel crew that are building wall panels, unskilled labor. But if it says X here, they put a stud there. If it says L, they put, uh, right? So everything is pretty easy to manufacture, even trusses with the technology, with these linear saws and these inked plates and the way we label our trusses. We make it very easy to 
first of all, make it attractive to get a guy to build trusses in the yard, to make it attractive to have these guys and gals build houses in the field. So I see it. I see the change. Um, it's either, you know, the saying adapt or die, because if I don't do it, someone else is going to do it. And with all my companies, these are more value add. I have a lumber company. I have a trust company. I have a wall panel company. I have a crane company. I have a logistics company. And trusses is kind of the driving force of all my entities. And they're all pretty much standalone entities, but they're more, they started them off as added value. I mean, I have guys buying wall panels and not buying trusses. I have guys buying trusses and not lumber. So they're all standalone. But when we can get that whole package deal, which we have a lot of those, um, it's pretty impressive and pretty, uh, it's, it, it's, it's awesome when I sit back and look at, guys, we just did that whole package as TF companies, Trust Fab, TF Lumber, TF Panels, Crane Co., uh, TF Transportation. When all my entities are humming together, it's, 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 it's mind boggling how fun it is. So the automation has just really changed the game. So Dean, let me ask you, that's a little bit unusual in this industry to have so many separate companies sort of under one umbrella. What what was it that you saw and what or what advantage do you do you have from sort of having those all as separate uh, standalone companies? Well, some guys want a one stop shop, right? He wants to come in, just throw his blueprints on my desk and say, give me everything to build this house. And all right, so we sit out the lumber. Uh, we ship out the trusses, we ship out the hardware. Uh, we just don't put it together. Um, you know, we'll crane it up for you. So, like I said earlier, added value entities. People want to come in and they want a one-stop shop, um, but not everybody wants that. And But I'm able to offer that. Uh, we have a lot of, you know, my corner here, we're surrounded by some really big lumber companies and big trust companies. Um, so I have to, you know, this, this market is very competitive. I think a lot of us know each other and, and we're pretty good competitors. Um, we're all just out there trying to do the same thing we're providing for our families. And, you know, it, the more products I can offer, the better it is for me and, and my employees and their families. You know, I surround myself with some really good people. You're only as good as the people that work for you. My team you know, I'll go to bat for any company out there. You know, what a great staff I have. Um, our turnover rate is is very low. Um, I'm not a believer in stealing employees or anybody can steal employees. I don't think there's such a thing. I think uh, if anybody leaves my company or people that leave different companies, they weren't happy. So we need to make sure we offer and provide a great place employment and how am I going to do that? Well, make it easier for them, make it fun, make it energetic. I, I need innovators. I need forward thinkers. And, you know, those are the things that kind of kept us going. And we have entity meetings every week and say, hey, guys, what what can we do different? What what does the customer want? What do they don't want? What you know, what, why would they buy from me and then instead of my competitor? Well, relationships are huge and being able to perform, you know, price is huge. We get that, right? The builders are always gouging us and hounding us for price. I don't want to say gouge, but I mean, they're going to, you know, if I went to, to, to my professor at ASU and said, Hey, uh, I have this opportunity to, to uh, supply this product on these jobs but my customer wants to see all of my numbers and wants to see all my profits and all my costs. Probably laugh me out of the room. Well, that's what some of these people want out there, these builders or different customers. They want you to be transparent. It's okay to be transparent, but at the end of the day, we all have to make money. And, you know, with the commodities the way it is and the things we dealt with last year uh, with lumber, uh, it really got some other alternative material products into the marketplace, whether it be uh, Hercutec walls or um, SIPS panels or steel framing. You know, when commodities get that crazy, there's always that target number that 
makes other materials look attractive. And I think we hit some of those numbers last year that made it attractive for alternative materials. So the more we can get a control on that, and that's some of the struggles with, you know, being a trust manufacturer is the, the, the volatility of this lumber market. It's very difficult to educate your builders when one week or, or keep your builders happy when one week lumber is 500,000 and you come to work and it's 600,000. I mean, I get it. There's price fluctuation in, in commodities, but when you have these drastic changes, it's not good for anybody, whether they go up or down. So those are kind of the struggles that we dealt with and being able to have more control on our commodity pricing and purchasing and having all these different entities working together, the value add, it, it helps us our buying power or per se, uh, d just different deals we can have with our vendors because our vendors are our best, you know, success rate, the more they can help us out better for everybody. So. Well, you interest you hit upon a, a few interesting points, and I'm curious just to clarify. Um, you know, most component manufacturers, if you ask them today, what's your biggest problem? Uh, almost all of them would say labor. There's just they can't find enough people to build the trusses that that, that their customers are demanding currently. But it sounds like you right. you kind of have your labor down. Not that it isn't a, a challenge, but it doesn't sound like it's your biggest challenge. You just mentioned commodities and sort of trying to navigate huge price fluctuations with a commodity like lumber is is a challenge. Um, would you say one of those is your biggest challenge, or is there something else when you're looking at trying to implement your particular business strategy? What what do you see as sort of yeah one of your biggest challenges or the biggest challenge? Kind of kind of managing our growth you know, without kind of overextending our risk. Um, some of these contracts, they want you to hold prices for a long time. Well, that's, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna gamble on lumber. I have a demand for my product and, you know, basic laws of supply and demand. And uh, when there's a demand, you know, we're gonna be compensated for it. Uh, when the demand's not there, then, then we'll reevaluate. But, you know, the struggles of keeping up with the demand, knowing, you know, what our real output can be, um, being as efficient as possible. But the struggles of, you know, when we offer, when when you're uh, kind of a go-to facility, which I think one of our companies are, uh, that's the reason for our success and, our, and the volume we do is, I think we do a pretty good job. Everybody has their struggles. Can't make everybody happy, right? But I think the better job at, um, you know, just committing to what our real output can be. So just the struggles are just controlling, you know, our output. What can we, you know, what can we really do? Uh, our ship times, our lead times, like you said, commodities, it's very difficult to get a handle on when you're in a, a, a crazy market. Um, you know, with also having, you know, with the truss yard, we have maybe 15 or 20 SKUs, but our lumber yard, you know, we have multiple. So just the struggles, uh, uh, my my purchasing uh, girl, Kelly, uh, does a really good job at maintaining and, and, and watching our, uh, our lumber prices and material flow and uh, just the inventory control. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's managing the growth. It's hard to say no. I think you'll ask everybody in my company, <laughs> Dean, uh, you're allowed to say no once in a while. But like I said earlier, uh, I know what it's like not to have work. So, But you don't want to commit to stuff that you can't perform on. And right now, with the demand for everybody's product, you're starting to see six to eight to 10 week lead times out on trusses. So it's not only being able to build the house fast, we got to get trusses on the ground. So you could be, you know, you can have all this automated prefab wall panels and, and all that, but if we can't get trusses on the ground, that's a problem. So realistic expectations from the builders, uh, trying to get some real schedules. Uh, what happens is, is there's no crews in the subdivision and a concrete company will go in and he'll pour nine slabs. And then the builder calls the framing contractor and says, 
hey, we got nine slabs sitting here. Well, yeah, they just poured them on Saturday. We didn't know about it. So the sporadic, the chaotic scheduling in this business, uh, some people get it and some people don't. So the, some of the builders we work with struggle with that and some builders do a really good job with that. And um, so, yeah, the, the realistic expectations and, and knowing what your real output is and just having a grasp on your business. You know, it's interesting. I think you may have just hit upon this, but I, I want to make sure what your answer would be. If you could change one thing about how, you know, the construction industry operates right now, like, and you could just snap your fingers and, and change it, what, what would you identify? What would you like to have work differently? And how would you prefer it work? Um, you know, I think uh, if I could change anything in this business, it's just realistic expectations. Um, I think uh, with the equipment out there, we can cut it fast. We can build it fast. I think the next struggle, and I'm starting to see it with these uh, equipment manufacturers and the plate manufacturers of the material handling. How do we get it from the saw to the table and from the table to the truck fast? Um, there's been a lot of automated, you know, whether it be the conveyors or the overhead uh, conveyors. So if changing, if the next kind of big change in my yard is really streamlining material flow. So, but, but if I would change anything in this business, it's, it's, I think there's so much change that's happening right now. We don't even understand a lot of the change happening. It's getting to a different level. I think our industry is very attractive for change. That's why there's so much money pouring in to our industry because, you know, some of those other markets are saturated with, you know, the car industry or the phone and microchips, whatever. But they see building houses as the next how do we build a house with a robot? How do we get more units, more efficient, cost effective for the consumer? How can I build affordable housing with a robot? And that's kind of where we're at. And, and the stuff I see and read and the videos I see, did, did I ever think I could see a trust being built with a robot? Well, it's out there. And and it's only going to get better. And, you know, you, you have the naysayers and the, and the guys that struggle with change, oh, that'll never happen. That'll never happen. Well, you know what? It's happening, and it's and it's happening right now. Our company, I mean, our industry, in two years will be so different. Um, the way we do business, how we do business, who we do business with, that's all coming to a big forefront and change as we speak right now. Because, I mean, there's a lot of behind the scenes talk of just so much change and in, 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 in the way we're doing business. So last question for you. Um, you know, you've talked a lot about embracing innovation, uh, embracing automation. You just got done talking about sort of all the change that you see coming into the industry over the next few years and all the investment dollars that seem to be helping to drive that. I think the the question that's on a lot of people's minds is how you know what kind of return on investment do you expect then? How how do you work that into the equation of is a large capital expenditure on the front end, and definitely there are there are benefits and advantages to that investment. But what kind of expectation do you have? Um, and any you know whether it's a trust plan or any of your other companies, what kind of investment? what kind of expectation do you have to get a return on whatever you invest in, in sort of that equipment and that innovation? How do you, you know, just put, you pushing that? out units. Um, so we touched on this earlier of, of how we do business and who we sell to. I think uh, the builders want change and it's not easy for uh, the Arizona market. Um, you know, these national builders have different platforms across the country, and I think they want to have a uniform way of doing business, whether it's having contracts with the trust plants or the lumber yards or um, however, they want to control everything, which I get it. But there's there's a lot of things going on also with software with who's, you know, is the trust plant the only people that can design trusses? Well, now I hear, you know, 
Structural engineers have the software. There's companies overseas uh, partnered with different software companies that design. So it's taking the uniqueness out of the trust plants uh, for design. You know, people like to deal with, say, Freddie at TrustFab. Hey, this guy's an awesome designer. He does a great job. Boom. Well, now when you have, when you start to, to have these big companies train designers, it, it takes a lot of that, a lot of that uniqueness out of the facility. So the change is coming and, and, and how we do business and who we do business with. So these builders want change. They, uh, they'll get change but it's how they go about it and, and and it's who's willing to be a disruptor per se or who's willing to to gamble and um say sell direct to these builders but it's it's just educating our customer base and the builders it doesn't you know i have different formulas and different conversations with both builders and 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 framing contractors and different homeowners it's you know, it's, it's hard and I know what they're trying to get and we can give them a lot of that, but it doesn't have to be a bloodbath. And, um, like I said, with all these other companies popping up, if I don't kind of reinvent my company and how we do business, you know, maybe we're not in business in a few years. So always embrace change. Um, be be an innovator, always be a forward thinker, don't get tunnel vision. I surround myself with people that, you know, they see what's happening in the industry. The, the like I said earlier, the forefront of change. How do we stay relevant? How, how do my entities add value? You know, how do we hold accountability? Uh, what are we accountable for? Uh, what are, what are my, what are my expectations of the consumer? Well, what do they want from me? Well, I need to figure that out and provide it. And if I don't provide it, well, somebody else will. And we just have to go about it smart um, and, you know, try not to burn bridges along the way and, uh, you know, give the consumer what they want. And and at the end of the day, we're trying to sell houses. We're We're trying to build houses. We're trying to build houses efficiently, um, cost effective. Uh, there's markets out there where how can people afford a house at that price value? Um, so, you know, we have to look at the next generation, th these young kids trying to buy a house, or do they even want a house? You know, let's look at the different types of product out there now. Uh, you know, the, you look at the loft of living, you look at these uh, rental income units, which is really hot in Arizona right now. Um, I don't think uh, this younger generation, I don't think they want the house. I think they want the, <laughs> they live in a loft with the DJ at the pool and the, the door guy. And, uh, you know, that's attractive to those guys, you know, mowing the yard on Saturday and fixing the plumbing leak. I mean, that's not, they, they don't like it, but the consumer, uh, the, the product that people want is changing, I believe. And, uh, We'll see. We'll see what kind of what you know what runs in this market in different markets. Dean, thank you so much for your time today. Um, yeah, I think you've given us a, a lot of good insight into sort of how you've grown your business and how you have made yourself successful. Uh, appreciate all of the things that you've shared. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, let's keep building some components. <laughs> right. Thank you for listening to SPCA's podcast, Component Connection. We are committed to bringing you a variety of information via this podcast. Please email your feedback or suggestions for future topics to podcast at sbcindustry.com.